If you remember last weekend, we talked about verses 1 through 19, and he, Daniel, who nothing negative is said about in the scriptures, okay? There's two men in the Old Testament that nothing critical is said about them. Not that they're perfect, but not, their sins are not pointed out. That's Daniel, and the other one is for free coffee at Tree Vine, just teasing, is Joseph. <laughs> Joseph. It's Daniel and Joseph, okay? So Daniel's confessing the sins, his own sins, and the sins of his country in these verses. And he's asking God to work. So we're going to pick it up in verse 20, and we're going to talk about, and I hope I can get through all of it, there is a prophecy in this portion of Daniel that is uh, fascinating. Fascinating. As a matter of fact, I'm holding uh, a book in my hand by Dr. Chuck Missler, who is um, with the Lord now. But he's a great Bible teacher. And he wrote a little book on this called Daniel's 70 Weeks. And if you've never picked this book up and read it, it's, uh, it's really good. And... Dr. Missler has a way of uh, uh, going very, very deep into a passage. Some of you here uh, are well acquainted with him. Maybe others not so much, but he's really good. Okay, verse 20 of Daniel 9. Now, while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, verse 21, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me. And in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering, he gave me instruction and talked to me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you that you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Now, verses 24 through 27 are another paragraph, which is a bit of a different topic. It's the vision that's revealed. We just read the run-up to it. Now let's read verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgressions, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and to discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be 70, seven weeks, pardon me, and 62 weeks. It will be built again with a plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Verse 27. And he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to the sacrifice and grain offering. On the wings of abomination will come the one who makes desolate even until the complete destruction, one that is decreed and poured out on one who makes desolate. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity that we find in scripture, how it speaks to us, and how we can understand you and the world we live in and the times we live in, Lord. I pray as we open this passage that we will understand, Lord, what is happening, Lord, what you have said, Lord, what that means, and then how you want to apply it to our lives. Uh, bless us as we look into your word, and we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so in Daniel, the first six chapters are historical. The last six chapters are prophetic. In Daniel, the, the Gentile kingdom, like the Gentile world, is unfolded, and we see kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. As he's confessing the sins of his people in verses 1 through 19, when we get to verse 20, it says this, and there's some things I want to bring out about this. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins, so 
his prayer was audible, okay? You can pray in your head sometimes, but his prayer was audible. He was speaking it out. And he was praying to God. He's confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel, okay? He wasn't giving God all the plausible reasons why they did what they did. He wasn't making excuses. He wasn't rationalizing. He was saying, this is what we did, and this is wrong. Matter of fact, when I wrote the prayer request on the board this morning, I just had to go to Daniel. I just opened it, and I went to, to verses four, um, uh, verse 5 and 6, and I just wrote out what he said they were doing because we've done the same thing. And he said, I'm just confessing and presenting my supplication, asking the Lord to work because he said, I'm reading in Jeremiah and we're supposed to be here 70 years and then everything gets rebuilt in the land. So he starts to pray for it. And he says this, presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, in behalf of the holy mountain of God. Now, when they say the mount, they mean Mount Moriah, which is where the temple stood, which is also, by the way, when Abraham takes Isaac to the mount to sacrifice him, guess what mount, mount, mount range it's on? It's on Mount Moriah. And then he says, on the mountain of the Lord, he will provide. And Abraham is actually, as he's there uh, uh, offering the sacrifice, he's actually looking to what? He's looking to Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And he's prophesying in the spirit that that would happen. Now, so when he says... When he says, uh, the holy mountain of God, that's the mount where the temple stands. So he's in prayer, and he's going before the Lord, and he's confessing his sins, and he's, what he's doing right now is he's interceding on behalf of God's people, okay? And what that means is that's a role where it's Moses in the Old Testament. Um, Jesus is described this way for us in the New Testament, um, and it is a distinct ministry. In 1 John uh, chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, My little children, I'm writing this thing to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So he says, you know what? When you sin, you have an intercessor, an advocate, and that's Christ. He's sitting at the right hand of God. So Daniel is being an intercessor. He's standing between God's people and God and presenting and confessing all their sins and interceding for God to work with the land and the people and to restore it all, okay? You'll hear people talk about this role as an intercessor. That's what an intercessor really does, is you pray and you confess your own sins, but you also pray for a group of people that God would do a work in and among them. And that's really on Sunday mornings at eight, that's really one of the things we're trying to do, is pray for our nation, right? that we wouldn't find an answer in politics or in the economy or in our military, but that we would find an answer in being a good nation and a good nation based on what God sees as good, a godly nation, right? Where we'd be just and gracious. Okay, so he's praying. He's interceding. He's doing this role. He's going before the Lord on behalf of his land and his people and saying, Lord, please do a work. And maybe you've been there, right? Praying for somebody you love, asking God to work. So what happens? Um, you ever feel like when you pray, your prayers bounce off the ceiling? Have you ever felt that before? You don't have to raise your hands. It's good to know they don't, right? Look at verse 21. While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, who I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness. Okay, now I need to tell you, we got to know who Gabriel is, okay? So if you take and go back to Daniel 8, which is the chapter before, we're in 9. And if you look at verse 16, he says, I heard the voice of a man, in verse 16 of chapter 8, between the banks of the Uli, and he called out to me and said, Gabriel, give this man understanding of the vision. So there's a man who calls to Gabriel and says, hey, angel Gabriel, explain the vision to Daniel. And, uh, and so um, we see him mentioned there uh, by name. Now you may say, who's Gabriel? It sounds like I've heard that name before. You have. There's actually a song that I won't sing to you about the angel Gabriel coming from heaven and speaking to Mary. And uh, I listen to it every Christmas on repeat. Let's, let's um, think about this. So Gabriel talks to Daniel Gabriel comes. 
Gabriel is the messenger who talks about the coming of the Messiah. That's what he does. He comes and he gives people messages, right? And so there's two other times he's mentioned, and I want to share them both with you. I'm going to go to Luke chapter 1. So if you want to flip into your Bible, Luke chapter 1, they happen to both occur in Luke chapter 1. And men who have been able to be there for our prayer times on Friday morning will know where I'm going. So I'm in Luke 1. All right? Now, this is a man named Zacharias. And he is attending at the altar of incense. And he's praying. All right? And in verse 12, Luke chapter 1, Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. And the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. Okay, his wife was advanced in years. Um, ladies, you figure out what the age that is? I don't know, don't really care. His wife was advanced in years. They had no children. So everybody would have known, Zacharias, you're a priest, but you have no kids. There's some secret sin in your family or some secret sin in your life or something because God's not giving you children. So God's not blessing you. And his wife would have had to endure that because she would have gotten the lion's share of the blame on that. So there, he's praying, Lord, please give us a child. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. This is the angel. The angel's coming from heaven to go, by the way, your prayer has been heard. Now, he's at the altar of incense. And when you read in Revelation, the prayers of the saints are like the incense that goes up from the altar to the Lord. Okay? So when you pray, it's like a beautiful aroma in God's nostrils, if you will. It says, Elizabeth will bear a son, verse 13, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness and will rejoice at his birth. And then he goes on to talk about John the Baptist coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah. In verse 18, Zechariah says to the angel, How will I know for certain? For I'm, I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel. Okay, he identifies himself by name. Who stands in the presence of God. I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Gabriel shows up and gives Zechariah good news. Your wife is going to have a child. And guess what? Your prayer has been answered. God hears you when you pray, and he answers them. And in these cases, only a few cases, he sends Gabriel. Uh, every um, Jewish girl would pray the same thing. Although it's not in Scripture, here, I'm going to tell you, they would always pray that they would be given the gift of giving birth to the Messiah. Even to this day, uh, some Jewish sects, the women are still praying that they would give birth to the Messiah because they don't think the Messiah has come. So let's stay in Luke chapter 1, and let's go down. And this is where you think of Christmas as we look in verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee up north, a small little town called Nazareth. We had some uh, vehicles in the parking lot last night about 8 or 9 o'clock. And uh, you'll have to forgive me. Don't feel insulted. But I went out to chat with them just to check. And they were nice people. We were just chit-chatting. They said, we're from Hillsboro. And immediately, I thought, no, I didn't think Tampa. That is the county. You're right. I thought, I thought a Hilliard, right? Because I, I thought of Columbus. I said, well, you guys live near Columbus. And they said, oh, no, no, no. We live between Cincinnati and... Um, some little town. I forget what they said. They, they said, we live out in the, way out in the country. Because I kind of forgot for a minute where Hillsborough was. There's a lot, of, a lot of towns in Ohio, just so you know, okay? Um, that's kind of Nazareth, okay? You, you're from where? Hills, where is that place? So the angel's going to Nazareth. I want you to get the understanding. This is a little tiny hamlet. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming he, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. He 
She was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. Verse 30, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. He said, do not be afraid a lot, doesn't he? For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Gabriel does what? He shows up and says, Mary, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. This is Gabriel. He appears to three people. Daniel, Zechariah, who's the father of John the Baptist, and to Mary. And each one, two of the three, had been actively praying. Mary, we can, we can plausibly believe that she would have prayed as a righteous woman and a faithful Jew to give birth to the Messiah. So he's saying, do not be afraid. You're going to give birth to the Messiah. So let's go back to Daniel. So this is Gabriel. This is what he does. He shows up, and he gives this kind of information. And it's also interesting because we're going to get to something else coming up here in a minute, um, which I'll get to in verse 23. And he says, whom I'd seen in the vision previously came to me in my extreme weariness. So when he was praying, he's exhausted, okay? Like he was pouring his heart out before the Lord. And really, really, sometimes when you pray, it can be very tiring. And he was so tired. And he says this, let's look at this at the end of verse 21. About the time of the evening offering. Now, the evening offering was our time, 3 p.m., Remember, is there a temple right now? No. 586, the temple got flattened. Is there an evening offering right now? No, because there's no temple. How long has he lived in Babylon? He's in his 80s. He probably got there when he's 15. He's still remembering what? The offerings that would happen at the temple that were not happening. He's still relating his time frame by what God would be doing by having an evening offering, even though there was no evening offering. That's also the time when they would go to pray. They'd go at 9 a.m. and noon and 3 p.m. If they were in Jerusalem, they'd go to the temple and they'd pray. Time of the offering. So he says, this is the time. It's time of the offering. He's remembering God and his temple. Is there a temple right now in Israel? No, there's not. So there's been two temples. There's one that Solomon built. You guys know the temple Solomon built. David gave him all the gold. David said, I'd like to build you a temple, Lord. And God said, you're a man of war. Too much blood on your hands. He's your son. Your son that spending way too much time in Proverbs 7. I, you know, I looked at the drinks out there, and I was like, no guy is going to order a Proverbs 7. Anyway, um, you know, crazy woman thing. Anyway, so he's like, uh, not that she's crazy, but immoral. That's the whole point. Stay away from her, guys. And so the point is, he goes, he goes, you know, Solomon's going to build a temple. So Solomon builds a temple, right? That temple's there, and that temple gets destroyed by the Babylonians. Those who are in captivity in Babylon are going to be able to go back to the Holy Land and rebuild the temple uh, under Artaxerxes, and they're going to rebuild a temple and dedicate it, and uh, it's going to be added on to a lot um, by Herod, and that's the same temple that Jesus went to. And that's the second temple. And it was beautiful because Herod kept it. Years and years he added on to it. In 70 AD, that temple gets flattened. Since 70 AD, the Jews have not had a temple to go worship in. So there's Mosaic Judaism. There's Judaism that's in the Old Testament that has a sacrificial system. In 70 AD, they could no longer offer sacrifices. So it went from a sacrificial system that was mosaic in nature, looking forward to the ultimate sacrifice of the Messiah, to rabbinic Judaism, where they followed particular teachers. And they would tell you that if you did this good deed or that good deed, it was as if you offered a sacrifice. And there's no temple yet. Now, I'm going to tell you there's a temple coming up. There's actually two temples coming up. Uh, one for the tribulation and then one for the millennial kingdom, which are kind of beyond the scope of this. But there's no temple, but his mind is oriented around seeing the temple and the temple offering. Okay, verse 22. All right, so Gabriel starts to speak to him. He gives me instruction and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have come forth to give you insight and understanding. 
Because Daniel had been praying, and he wanted to know, when are you going to restore your holy mountain and your people? When are you going to do this work, Lord? And he's saying, Daniel, I've come to explain this to you. Now, verse 23. At the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued. Okay, that's pretty cool. Is it just me? or do I, I, I like? He started praying, and God goes, Hey, Gabriel, head down to go see Daniel. You got, a, you got a message for him. I mean, Gabriel knew what the message was, right? Like, I mean, I mean, how long did God have to tell him? I don't know. Who knows? Doesn't even say it. He's like, go down and tell Daniel. So, like, from the minute you started praying, I was sent into action to come and bring you this message. Sometimes we think that when we pray, you know, God's up in heaven going, I'm so busy, okay? I, I, put, it, put it on voicemail. For those of you who are young, that's like a text that's left unread. You know, uh, just, I'll get to it in a minute, right? God doesn't do that. He hears you when you pray, and the Lord, as the Holy Spirit speaks through us as we pray, things happen in real time and space. And from the minute he started the supplications, he says, the command was issued and I have come to tell you. Now, you are highly esteemed. I just want to, for a minute, mention a couple things here about this, which I think are important to understand. Um, what was Mary called by Gabriel? Favored one, right? Highly esteemed. It's kind of cool. Two out of three people Gabriel shows up to, he calls them highly esteemed, right? Jesus told his disciples and us, he calls us friends, he calls us beloved. In Ephesians, we're called the beloved. I want to share something with you um, that I find very fascinating, and I hope you do too. Uh, Chuck, Chuck Missler mentioned this years ago, and, um, and I remember reading it recently, and I thought, this is kind of interesting. In the book of John, chapter 11, I want to share something with you. So if you want to flip over to John, I'm going to share a couple verses out of John, because I want to uh, tell you something about John, and then hopefully tie it with Daniel, because I, I think it's actually uh, important to know this. So I'm sharing it. So I'm in John 11. I'm in verse 23. Uh, you know what? That's, that's way off. Okay, sorry. Let's go to John 20. Pardon me. I'm in the wrong chapter. Um, sometimes I look at my writing and think I should have been a doctor. Forgive me, doctors. Um, so in, in the book of John... Um, John is called the disciple that Jesus loved. And um, when Jesus resurrects from the dead, Mary Magdalene sees it in verse, chapter 20. And uh, in verse 2, she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then they run to the tomb, and uh, the other disciple, because John is younger, beats him to the, beats him to the tomb. But in, in uh, verse 2, he's called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, in chapter 13 of John, uh, it is mentioned, as they're reclining at the table, chapter 13, verse 23, there was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So that's John 13, 23. So John is called the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, there's a lot of speculation why that is. Maybe because he was kind of rough around the edges. He was the youngest, John 13, 23. He was the youngest. So Jesus would have sat at the head of the table and they would have all reclined. And as they would have kind of like laid back, they would have kind of reclined toward each other. So John would have been reclining toward Jesus. The youngest would have been at this part of the table. So that makes perfect sense. Um, John receives revelation. 
John receives the unveiling of Christ in the New Testament. If you want to understand prophecy, the two books you really have got to master is Revelation, written by John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And the other book in the Old Testament you need to master is uh, Daniel. And if you go back to Daniel chapter 9, he's highly loved, desired. That in the Greek it means desired or esteemed. So I think it's interesting that the spokespeople that God chose to give us these revelations of future events were loved and esteemed. And it's also interesting because the Lord says that he has poured his love into your heart by giving you the Holy Spirit. Malachi says, says to Israel, I have loved you. And you know what Israel says back to God? This is great. They're like, how have you loved me? Right? We went through that Wednesday, which I cracked up, you know. And then he explains how he loved them. And I think we ask the same question, God, how do I know you love me? Well, I think we can look to a cross and look upon the one whom they have pierced, right? If we look at Jesus on the cross, stretching his arms out, there's no, nothing more loving than self-sacrifice. And he gave himself. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for you that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Like without the shedding of blood, there's no cleansing of sin, which is why you've got to have a temple if you're a Jew, because you've got to have shed blood. As a Christian, the Bible teaches Christ died once for all, the just for the unjust. So it's clear. His blood's been shed. So that's the blood I look to. I don't have to have more blood shed. It was done once for all. He stretches his arms out and says, paid in full. That's what he says in Greek, paid in full. And the point is, is that, is that that's how you know you're loved. Daniel was loved. John was loved, and they're used as special mouthpieces for God. You are highly esteemed. So give heed. Uh, when you read Revelation, lots of people are interested in that book. One of the guys I was talking to last night, not to pick on him, but um, it is always funny when somebody uh, is talking to um, a Christian and they want to mention something biblical. And he said, I've been watching on TikTok. I said, oh, yeah? He said, I'm, I'm watching on TikTok that those 12 seals are uh, starting to happen. And I thought, well, that's, there are 12 disciples. Uh, there, are six, there are seven seals. There's only seven in Revelation. So I, 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 somebody told me it was inflation. That's what happened, right? There was one seven, and now there's 12. Anyway, so, I, you know, and I, I kind of laughed at myself. But when you read Revelation, I thought it was cute. I invited them to church and the Lord, most importantly. Um, verse 3 in Revelation 1, it says, Blessed is he, or you could say she there, whomever, this man there, who reads those who hear the words of this prophecy. So if you read it, that's great. If you do the audio version, if you hear it, that's great too. It says in what? And heeds the things which are written in it. Now, that word heed is a very important word. That means you keep it. And so if we go back to Daniel chapter 9, he says, give heed to the message. This is an important message you're going to get, Daniel. I want you to write it out, and I want you to communicate it and gain understanding of the vision. Because right now, Gabriel's about to tell Daniel probably the most significant prophecy in all of Scripture. Uh, I've got a handout, which I think we're getting close to running out of time here, um, that I want to give everybody, and it's going to take this whole formula and break it down to the point where you can give dates of when Christ came his first time, all right? And there, it's in a lot of different books, and it was found by one man, and it is a theory that's been tried and tried and tried, and it's hard to argue against it, and it gives the dates of the triumphal entry to the day. And, uh, and we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So this is commonly called the 70 weeks of Daniel. Now, um, as I read verse 24, it says 70 weeks have been decreed. So it's easy to go a week is seven days. 70 weeks, it's 
that's not very long, right? 70 weeks, 490 days. Well, they would use seven sometimes, like we use, if I say, you know, that was a decade ago. I don't have to say 10 years. You just know it was a decade ago, right? Or two decades ago. They would use seven as a measurement of time. So when they say 70 weeks, what we receive this as, as weeks of years. So it's actually 490 years. It's 70 weeks of years. So that's what it's going to look like. Uh, so one week, one week actually means seven years, which is why when we get to verse 27, it's going to talk about the last week, which is the last seven-year tribulation. That's where we get it from. Let's talk about the middle of the week, which we will get to, uh, looks like next week, in more detail. All right? So 70 weeks. So God, after he goes for national repentance, and after he is in prayer with the Lord, and after Gabriel comes to him because he's highly favored, he's, he's loved by the Lord, after he's told to heed the message, God says, I'm going to give you a time stamp. Okay? Now, at Calvary, we don't set any dates in the future at all. But there are dates in the past that you can actually say this was prophesied and it actually literally happened. And next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure you guys all have a handout. Um, there's a man named David Guzik with Enduring Word Ministries, or Enduring Word. Um, he's a phenomenal guy. Uh, it's, it's information that he put on his website that we can share. And it goes back to a man who ran Scotland Yard named Sir Robert Anderson, who did a ma massive calculation of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And we're going to do that next week, all right? Because um, we'll need more time to do that. But what I want to leave you with is, is the 70 weeks are for your people in your holy city. What had, been, what had Daniel been praying about? The people? In the city, right? So he's like, Lord, do this work among your people and your city. And when he's praying that, the whole Holy Spirit, God, Father, God, the Son, they dispatch Gabriel and say, go talk to Daniel. He's like, Daniel, I got a vision. It's going to be 70 weeks of years for the people and the city, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And we are literally going to be able to set our clocks by this. And when we get to it next week, I hope everybody comes back next week. You're going you're gonna to realize why there's certain teaching in the New Testament that Christ gives because of this particular prophecy. Because he actually held the people accountable to know this prophecy. So we're going to know it, and we're going we're gonna to walk through it next week in, uh, in detail. So uh, as I was preparing uh, yesterday, I looked at what we had. And um, I thought, I hope we can get through it. But I wasn't uh, optimistic we could. <laughs> so here we are. All right? So what can we do for takeaways? Uh, number one, I think we all need to revisit our prayer lives. Individually, corporately, praying with somebody. Um, to think about God listening to your prayers and dispatching an angel to come down to Daniel. It's serious business. You know, when the, when, as I've told you before, the disciples, 120, they were in the upper room. Jesus is resurrected. He's ascended. And they've got, they've got 10 days. And they're in the upper room, and they're devoted to prayer, right? They're, obviously, they're studying the Word together, but they're praying together, okay? They're praying together. And so I'm not trying to guilt anybody to come for prayer at the church. I'm just saying, let's, me too. I'm, I'm talking to myself, probably more than you. Let's evaluate our prayer lives this week and say, are we really talking to the Lord, right? The Lord wants to do great things. Are we really taking our needs before the Lord? Uh, number two, all right, let's understand, because um, we know God answers prayer. Let's understand what, how God views us, okay? And this is not to say that I want you to sit here and go, you know, I, I'm so special, all right? Um, we're made of dirt, of the dust of the earth, and the only thing that's good in us is from God. But God does love you, all right? He adores you. He wants to answer your prayers. He wants to bless you. He wants to work in your life. 
And Daniel's in captivity, and he's asking the Lord, will you please restore your people and your sanctuary? And God says, Gabriel, go tell him, I'm going to do it. And you're sitting here today going, I'm looking at this need, and this need, and this need, and this need, and there's like an ocean of need. And I don't know what to do. And I read that stupid starfish thing where, you know, I threw the starfish in and it was like, I helped that starfish. Yeah, we've all read that, okay? You know what? Pray. Let's pray. And then God will guide us on how to, how to help people and what needs to really help, right? Because there, there is a notion of need. There is. I mean, I was talking to people last night. I'm talking to them about the Lord. And the guy looks at me and goes, I smell pot. And I said, I know. I said, it's the apartments. I said, it's horrible over there. They're always smoking pot. I said, but they're looking for something outside themselves, so they go to drugs. I said, we found Christ. They had to leave at that point. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, oh, look at the time. I have to go uh, do my nails. I don't know. Let's break the conversation. The point is, is that there's an ocean of need. But let's pray and ask the Lord to show us and lead us and guide us where the needs are and how we can meet them. It talks in Titus. You guys are in Titus. You know at the end of chapter 3, it says, we must engage to, in good deeds to meet pressing needs, right? So let's be a part of that. We do that through prayer. And we know we're loved by the Lord, and then we ask Him to open the doors. And the last thing I want to bring out in this little text here that we covered is that God is sovereign and He controls all of history. And he's telling Daniel, there's 70 weeks. And by the way, I'm going to give you the exact day the Messiah is going to come into Jerusalem. Exact day. On a donkey. Fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. And he's told us. He's told us, uh, there's going to be somebody in the future that they're going to fake his death. And they're going to animate something that people are going to worship. And people are all freaking out about AI. I'm like, why are you freaking out about AI? You're talking to an AI robot. I'm like, we already knew that. That's in Revelation 13. There's going to be one of those that's the Antichrist that people are going to supposed to worship, right? We, we've got that covered. Not we. God told us. He knows the future. So let's trust him with your own future, right? All right. I'm going to invite the worship team back. We're going to go to prayer and uh, trust the Lord with the rest of our day. Lord, we love you. We pray that you'll bless us and just... Uh, Thank you so much for the time we could spend in your word. We pray that we will remember as Daniel that we are um, loved by you and that, Lord, that you have a plan in this world that's unfolding and you're going to bring yourself the most glory through it. And so we just look to you for the future of our own lives and this world. And we want to be more about prayer, Lord. Help us to be more disciplined in prayer, devoted to prayer. So like Daniel... When he looks at the ocean of need, he goes to you and he prays, and you work in real time and space. Lord, we love you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.